mangiare con i garden. Mangiare da noi, calabur, capuia, calapula. you just heard was a song called I Am Australian. It, the first um, chorus you heard that was translated into the Yarrawarra language, which is an Australian Indigenous language group that um, is located in Broome in Western Australia. And then the, chor the second chorus was the original English version of the song. Hello there, my name is Raymond Teodo and I've been kindly asked by Ange, Angie of rockthebelly.com to give a presentation about Australian Indigenous um, music as part of your um, world music sessions. And I'm really um, happy and honoured to be a part of your pro this program tonight. Um, first off, I'd like to say thank you um, to rockthebelly.com. You guys do a great job at uh, exposing your listeners to a wide variety of music from different countries, different eras, different cultures. And I think that's great that you're sharing such a wide variety of music. Please keep up the good work that you're doing. So um, this recorded session, we're using a couple of different things. So I've used my phone to do screen recordings of the songs because the um, the sound quality is a lot better on my phone than it is on my laptop. And to be sharing screenshots, I'm using Screencast-O-Matic, which is a, um, is a free recording program, but you can um, upgrade and subscribe to get more features and functions, but I don't... Um, I don't subscribe to that. I don't have the money for that. So I'm just using their free recorder, which does limit me in some things, but does the job what I need, what I want to do. So just a little bit about myself. So, um, like I said, my name is Raymond Tioto. I am a um, primary school music teacher working in a teaching circuit, work between two different schools um, in, Ips in the Ipswich, Queensland, Australia area. Um, yeah, I really enjoy what I do. Um, sorry, I had to pause the video there. I was having a bit of a sneezing fit. I've got um, some dust allergies. So that's what that's all about. All right. Yep. So I'm a music teacher. I am really passionate about music from all over the world. Hence why I was, I agreed to do this um, presentation for Angie. Um, just to signpost this from the very beginning, I myself am not Australian Indigenous. My ancestors, um, come from all over Europe. Um, my father, on my father's side, I've got Italian in me and on my mother's side is English, Irish, Scottish and German. So while I myself am not Australian Indigenous, I have read enough and talked with enough Indigenous people and experienced um, certain things that allow me to be able to talk about this um, type of music and a bit about this culture. Obviously, we won't go into huge detail because that's covering thousands, literally hundreds of years of culture. So I'm not going to be going into anything in any particular huge depths, but I will be explaining enough about the about Australian Indigenous history and culture in order for you to be able to understand and appreciate the 
music that you'll be hearing today. So, before before I do any go any further, I'd like to do what we call is acknowledgement to country. So in Australia, in a lot of public venues, so, um, such as schools or other um, public functions, we do this acknowledgement to country. This is because for many, 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 many years, Indigenous Australians were denied the acknowledgement that before white settlement, this land, this country belonged to them. This is kind of our way of reconciling and acknowledging that the country that we're standing on was, is and always will be Indigenous country. So I'm going to start off with my acknowledgement to country. We would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay our respects to the elders both past, present and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hope of their people. To the left here is the um, Australian Indigenous flag, the Aboriginal flag. The one on the right is the Torres Strait Islander flag. When we're talking about Australian Indigenous peoples, we are talking about these two countries, these two cultures, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. And the acknowledgement of country, it varies in wording depending on where you go, but it is essentially acknowledging the traditional owners or the traditional custodians, depending on what region you're in. So the Indigenous land that I live and work and teach at is called Yagara Country. Um, you'll learn a little bit more about Yagara Country a bit later. Um, but yeah, that is the acknowledgement of country and it's important if we're going to talk about Australian Indigenous peoples and their culture and their music that we do this acknowledgement of country because we are talking about their culture in their country on their land. All right, this um, session is going to be split into two parts. The first part will be discussing the a very brief history of Australian Indigenous culture and how colonisation has affected the way in which Australian Indigenous culture is viewed today and how that has influenced the contemporary Indigenous music, the Indigenous music of today. The second part will be going through the songs, um, some select few that I've picked that I feel really stand out and highlight um, the Australian Indigenous music in this country. All right. So as you probably well know, language is an important part to anyone's culture around the world. What you're seeing here is a map of Australia, but it is divided into language groups. Um, Australian Indigenous culture before white settlement had a huge, vast, rich culture, and it was varied. Australia really was a whole continent even before white settlement and before we labelled it as a continent because all these different colours here are the different language groups. So if you think of like Europe, how it's divided into different countries and it's one continent, Australia was the same thing. It was divided into these little countries over here. So their countries are named after the language groups. So if I... Uh, that wasn't going to work. All right, so you've got all these different language groups here and my, where the land that I'm standing on is right this little bit here. Here we go. Oh, hang on, helps to move it to, here we go. That's Yagara Countries. This is where I'm currently working. I've also worked in Waka Waka Country as well for a time, but I was born and raised here in Yagara country, and I'm working here at the moment. So that's the, kind of like the Brisbane, Ipswich area, and it's pretty large area. It doesn't look large here on the map, but it is pretty big. So this map um, illustrates the 364 different language groups that used to exist before white settlement. Sadly, out of those 364 Indigenous language groups, only 28 
Only 28, you heard that right. Out of 368 language groups, only 28 of them are still being spoken today. And even out of that 28 language languages, um, there's only a small handful of those that are still full, complete languages. A lot of that language, the 28 remaining languages has been lost. That is due to how white settlers treated Indigenous people in this country. Um, they were forced to speak only English in some cases. In a lot of cases too, it was because of bloodshed. We had a lot of massacres in our country that wiped out entire language groups. So it is um, a really sad and dark part of our history, but in order to understand um, the music, the songs that we were listening to, you do need to understand the history as dark and terrible as it is. Yagara, unfortunately, uh, sorry, Yagara, fortunately, sorry, is um, one of the few languages that is a complete language. Um, Waka Waka, as far as I'm aware, is not a fully complete language, unfortunately, and we have fragments of other languages. The other reason, too, why these languages are dying out is because um, a lot of the older generation are elders are uh, passing away um, before being able to pass the language on to the younger generation. And then we also have the younger generation that aren't really interested in learning it as well. So you've got that factor as well. So you've got the effects of colonisation, the um, forcing of only speaking English, the massacres that occurred and the dying generation and the younger generation not wanting to participate in learning that language it, or contributing factors to uh, the language dying out. So that's a real crying shame. Yeah, the particular time point in history that I'll be mainly focusing on in my discussions on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander music um, is from 1900 to about the 1970s, so 1900 to about 1969. So in... January 1901, Australia was established as the nation that it is today. Um, and the first law that was established in 1901 was the White Australia Policy. Prior to the White Australia Policy, how um, Indigenous people were oppressed in my country was... Um, excuse me. Sorry, that was a school bell there. Prior to the White Australia policy, so when the white settlers first came to our country, they labelled Australia as ter terra nullius, which in Latin translates to no man's land. They vehemently argued, and even in the history books back in that time, that nobody had occupied the land even though it was clear that Australian Indigenous people were there and that they had occupied the land for thousands of years, they got away with it by saying, well, nobody's claimed it. We're going to call it terra nullius. This is no man's land here, therefore we have the right to claim it. And they had labelled Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as part of the flora. So they were basically walking, talking vegetables in the white settlers' eyes. They were plants. They were not even considered in the animal species hard to sink in, right? Then we have this white Australia policy. Now, even though it says here that it was trying to ban all non-Caucasian people from entering the country, so it affected immigration, but it also affected the way in which Indigenous people were treated. We, It was only about white culture, white civilization, and that whole European influence. All right. We have settlements such as um, Sherberg, which is near the area that I worked, which is in Waka Waka country. The settlements were established to, for lack of a better term, get rid of the blackness out of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So they were sent to work. 
um, slaves. Um, they were taught in the white ways of thinking. They were, like I said earlier, they were not allowed to speak their own language. Um, a lot of families were ripped apart. Um, children were taken away from their parents, which I'll talk about a little bit later on here. Um, I'll just skip through a lot of this and get to the important bits. Just wait a second. Here, 1910, the Aborigines Protection Board Act. This is where white people, so the, the government, had complete control over Aboriginal way of life to the point where things like they weren't allowed to marry without written consent by the governing bodies. They were not. Sorry, didn't realize that the um, recording cut out. So back to it. So the Aborigines Protection Board Act. So um, what I just mentioned before the video cut out. So things like marriage, they couldn't get married without permission from the government. Um, this is also the time where Aboriginal children were taken away from their parents in the with the hopes of raising them up the, the the right way, which is the white way. So you had whole generations being scattered because of laws like this where you could legally take Aboriginal children away from their parents, put them into white families and raise them like they're white people. That was one of the huge factors for the degradation of language and culture in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. That's how a lot of the culture and language was lost due to this time. We call the children that were taken away by the parents as the stolen generations. And if you want to know more about the stolen generations, there is a excellent film about it called Rabbit Proof Fence. It is the true story about three sisters who were taken away from their um, mothers and were taken away from their mother and placed onto a settlement where they were mistreated and they actually escaped and found their way back to back home again. So that sort of gives you an idea on the plight of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Rabbit proof fence, look it up. There is a heck of a lot of history which I'm not going to go into um, given the time frame, but I'm just going to pause this and get to the important bits. Okay, so basically we start from Terra Nullius where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people weren't even acknowledged as people, to the White Australia policy which affected not only Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but also immigration immigration laws as well, so people coming into the country from other countries. Then you had things like the Aborigine Protection Act, which affected every aspect of Indigenous way of living, including, as I mentioned earlier, the Stolen Generations. From about the 1930s, they changed the name from Protection, because they believed that they were protecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from their way of life, they changed to the assimilation policy, which is pretty much was pretty much the same laws, except it's assimilating. And this is where it was very similar to your segregation laws in the US, where you had your separate um, venues for white people, separate venues for black people. And forcing, basically forcing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to live like white people, um, forcing them to renounce their culture, their identity. Um, sorry, just pause it again. Should be mentioned here that we also had Indigenous people fighting for us in the World Wars. Um, they joined up believing that if they represented the country and we, you, you know, they helped us out on the front lines, they would get some sort of recognition when they came 
home, that their things would be better. They would see that what their worth is. Unfortunately, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander soldiers, war veterans were not even recognised in our Anzac Day marches, none of that stuff. Um, weren't even awarded their medals or anything. It was just back to normal business, which is really sad. I think it wasn't until about the 1960s or later that they started to recognise uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander soldiers that fought in both the world wars. Around the mid-1940s to 1950s, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were finally allowed a public school education. But there were heaps of restrictions on that too. For example, here you had to have a medical certificate to attend a public school. And there, down here, some of the attitudes towards why it took them so long to get allow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to be in the public school system is apparently beyond the age of 10, they couldn't keep up with white children anyway. Such was the thought and philosophy. And as an educator, that really ticks me off. But the, was, those are the time, those were the attitudes that people had towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. 1962 is the big year. This is when finally the state's were allowing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to vote. They are finally, finally, in the 1960s, being recognised as people, maybe a lower version of people because of the prejudice stuff, but people nonetheless. Eventually, 1967, finally by 1971, um, we finally recognised them in the census as, as people. We recognise them, we counted them in the census. So even though um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have won some freedoms, we still have a long way to go. In 2008, 2007 or 2008? I think it was 2008. The Prime Minister of our country at that time, who was Kevin Rudd, um, finally she did a public apology um, to the stolen generations, 2008, after X amount of years from the 1920s to 1960s, the stolen generations business was still happening. And then it was like another 40 odd years later before we finally acknowledged it and recognised that from the government up. And there is a national apology that's, that, um, Kevin Rudd did to publicly apologise for the way Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were treated. And again, that's a huge breakthrough many years later, but we still have a long way to go. The current issues that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face today is um, land entitlement, um, a lot of Indigenous land, particularly sacred Indigenous land, has been taken over by businesses and such and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are fighting to keep those sites sacred because there have been enough sites that have been desecrated already. We do have the um, the effects of poverty and generational abuse um, due to the trauma that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have suffered. We also have custody issues as well. So similar to how there's inequality and in how black people are treated in America in the eyes of the law. Um, same thing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, if you want to look up about the Aboriginal deaths in custody, um, that's about Indigenous people that have died while they were in jail and custody um, out of neglect by the people that should be taking care of them, that's in amongst it as well. So yeah, it's this huge bleak history and yet you'll see many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, still smiling, happy, they're resilient, despite the oppression and the abuses and so much um, stuff happening to them that continue to happen to them. And the music that is performed by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today really do reflect this, this 
the pain and the angst and the anger, but also the resilience and courage and strength. And I hope that you'll see that in the song samples that I'm going to share with you today. Like I said, this is based the the bare minimum. I've barely tipped the ice. I've barely touched the tip of the iceberg here with explaining Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and history. But I hope that I've explained enough for you to be able to understand and appreciate the songs that you'll be hearing today. And I will give Angie some resources to go with this video clips to share on the radio's website for those that want to learn more. All right. That's part one done and dusted. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to some of the songs. Um, the first song that you will be listening to is a song by a uh, Aboriginal man for, um, called Goromal. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2017. He not only had to deal with the struggles of being Indigenous, um, he was also born blind. He is a blind guitarist and singer, and his music is absolutely gorgeous. Um, the language that he sings, the the um, origin that he's from, is from Yongle country. Yongle is uh, a language group in the Northern Territory. I'll just quickly go into... I'll spell it out for you here. Yongle. That's his language group. And so he sings in that... Um, language in this song that you're about to listen to. Um, he teams up with another singer named Blue King Brown. Um, so she sings with him and the name of the song is called Gathul, Gathul Malwa. And it is an absolute beautiful track to start us conversation off with. So have a listen, enjoy it.
Absolutely breathtaking, wasn't it? So that was Garamol with um, Matu Yawala. Okay. Um, Garamol was part of an Australian Indigenous band called Yothu Yindi. And sorry for the interruption there. I was just talking to another staff member. Um, yes, Garamol was part of an Australian Indigenous band called Yothu Yindi. And when we're talking about not just Indigenous Australian music, but Australian music in general, our nationalist music, Yothu Yindi is iconic. Um, they are also a Yongle-based um, band, so Yongle from Northern Territory. They sing a lot about um, the plight of Indigenous peoples. They talk a lot about life in Aboriginal communities and the resilience of Indigenous peoples. So, yeah, we can't talk about Australian Indigenous folk music without mentioning them. So I couldn't decide which song I wanted to do from this band, so I decided to go with um, two in particular. Um, the first one is called Jabana, and... The, if you listen to the lyrics of the song, it talks about some of the history that I just mentioned about the mistreatment of Indigenous people by um, the white government systems at the time. So here is Javana. Take my mind back 
All right, that was Jabana as um, performed by Yothu Yindi, sung in English and in Yongle language. Um, the second song, also from Yothu Yindi, is a bit more upbeat and it speaks about hope. So whereas Jabana is talking about um, the injustice to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the way they're mistreated, um, this next song, World Turning, is one about hope and about the idea that one day there will be full emancipation, there'll be complete respect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. It's a really fun, upbeat song. Have a listen to World Turning by Yotha Yindi.
Turning right. Turning right. So that was World Turning by Yoffa Yindi. We now go to Yorta Yorta country. The Yorta Yorta is a place in Victoria, um, the language group that's there, the Yorta Yorta. And this, is song, this song is called Inner Name. And it's a bit of um, confusion as to the background story of this song, partly because the language has been lost and therefore parts of the song cannot be um, fully translated. The other reason is because there is some confusion as to the geographical location of where the song actually originated from. It is typically classed as a Yorta Yorta song, but there are also there's also evidence that it was sung and is still sung on the Torres Strait Islanders. Tor no, Torres Strait Islands. So if you know where the Torres Strait Islands are in comparison to Victoria in Australia, that's complete opposite ends of the country. So either the song had traveled from the Torres Strait Islanders down to Yorta Yorta or from Yorta Yorta up north. Um, in any event, it's performed and sung in both, both um, parts of Australia. This song is very famous, made particularly famous by a children's television show called Play School. And um, every child across the nation in Australia knows this song by heart. Um, the rough translation of what we can make out from the song, it's about a guana, um, guana being this large lizard. And the chu at the end, chu means go away, shoo. So you're chasing this guana around and getting it to go away. Shoo, shoo. The last part, chew, is the favorite part of all kids that sing this song. So it is a children's lullaby, actually. Um, when Angie was looking for children's lullaby, she was also looking for world music as well. And so I sort of combined the two and um, suggested this song. So this is In Our Name. Have a listen to it. Here we go. In
Sorry, returning back to Yothi Yindi. There was a third song that I wanted to include in the program and I forgot to play it for you. So this, going back to Yothi Yindi, so we're back in Yongle country, Northern Territory. This song is called Treaty. Treaty, it's a big historical event in Australia. This is where the first land entitlement rights were contested. And this song was all about the injustices that white people have had taking land that did not belong to them. Remember the whole terra nullius thing I spoke about earlier, where nobody supposedly owned the land, therefore white people will just take it. Treaty talks about otherwise. So this is all about the fight for land rights and entitlement. So here is Yothu Yindi with Treaty.
That was Yothu Yindi with Treaty. What a powerful rock song and a very important message to us all. All right, about the time we had some female representation, I've been looking at a lot of male artists, but now to look at some female Indigenous artists. This next song that you'll be listening to is also a children's song, it comes from the Torres Strait Islands, and it is sung by a very famous Indigenous singer called Christine Anu. The video clip that I um, found um, has another international Australian band, called, children's band called The Wiggles. And The Wiggles um, interviews Christine Anu and she explains the background story behind um, the song Tabo Naba. Um, so without further ado, I'll allow Christine to introduce the song to you personally as she's being interviewed by The Wiggles. And this is Christine Anu with Ta mm. Get my tongue back in my mouth. Tabanaba. Really awesome song. Have a listen to it. We're here with our special friend Christine Anu. Hi Christine. Hi everyone. Christine, can you tell us about the song Tabanaba? Sure. Tabanaba comes from the eastern Torres Strait Islands and it's sung in the Miriam Mir language. And what does it mean? It means let's all go down to the reef and have a great time. Yeah, that sounds like great fun. This song's best done sitting down. You might like to join in. Let's all go to the reef and have a great time. Tava. So that was Tabanaba. What a beautiful song sung by Christine Anu. Um, we're almost out of time. So I will finish off with one more song and we're gonna be finishing it off in Yagara country where I live and work in Yagara country. Um, this song is entitled Yagara Jarana, translates to standing on Yagara country. And the chorus is Ninda, you, Ninda, Ngari, Ngangambili, so you and me, all of us together, Yagara Jarana. So this uh, recording was done on Yagara country, so you and me, all of us together on Jagara country. So I'll finish that off with um, Yagara Jarana. This is a song that was made a couple of years ago by a bunch of both indigenous and non-indigenous um, elders, um, music educators and community members, all from the Yagara area. Um, it was part of a celebration for reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. It is a beautiful song about the promise of what a country can become and what, um, how much we can prosper as a nation if we band together and listen to our Indigenous elders and look after our land and the country and the waterways and our environment in general. It's an absolutely beautiful song. My choir kids are singing it 
next week for NAIDOC week. NAIDOC stands for National Aboriginals and Islander Day of um, Celebration. Um, we do this every year to um, celebrate um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. Normally we'd have it in about June or July, but due to COVID um, that didn't end up happening. It got postponed to um, November when things have started to ease up here, at least in Queensland, and restrictions have started to ease off a bit for us. So we're able to do NAIDOC week, not as big a celebration as we would normally do in previous years, but um, we're able to do that as well um, on a smaller scale. So I'm not showing you the recording on my choir kids because that's privacy reasons, but you've got me singing the choir parts for this one to finish off. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. And I hope that you gain some knowledge and understanding and some appreciation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and their music. Here is Yagara Jarana. This is Raymond Tiodo signing off and hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye for now. Nita Nita